So I might try it again. This is a prayer from Ephesians chapter 3. And we're going to pray this prayer for ourselves, a prayer that Paul writes in the letter to the Ephesians. And I thought it'd be helpful to pray. You know, we talked about what Paul uh, talked about in the first few chapters of his letter. And he basically zoomed in on the doctrinal bit of what Christ has done. Christ is a central figure in this whole letter to the Ephesians, what he has done, uh, what he has accomplished, and where he is now, where his, where his position is, and where are we now. And towards the end of all this foundational stuff that Paul is writing about, foundational but yet very deep and yet something that we can always apply uh, and can always come back to again to, to remind ourselves. At the end of these few chapters, you know, I these things, he writes this prayer for this reason. I'm going to pray this prayer uh, together. And this is something we can do often. When you come across any prayer in the Bible, you can appropriate the prayer uh, and use it for yourself. So for now, let's say I'm going to pray for all of us as an opening prayer this evening. So for this reason, we bow our knees before you, our Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of your glory, you may grant to us to be strengthened with power through your Spirit in our inner being, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, and that we, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. So it's interesting that he uses his prayer and he ends up with this bit about that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. If you understand what we talked about last week also, we're talking about how Jesus is everything. We are in Christ. Everything has been accomplished. It's because of Christ. We are now in Christ. We have received things through Christ, which means that because we have Christ, Christ is in us and we are in him, we actually have already the fullness of God. But this prayer is for us to realize, for us to comprehend and to understand. Because it's one thing to have it, but if we do not understand it, we won't know how to live in it or how to appropriate it and how to walk in that fullness. So what Paul is saying here is not that the fullness is not yet ours because we have Christ with everything. But he's saying, therefore, that we want to be open, we want to know, we want to understand the fullness and therefore we can walk also in the fullness of Christ that is in us. Well, we talked about last, uh, last Thursday, uh, we said there's one theme that Ephesians is centered on and that is unity. So Ephesians chapter 1 verse 10. Um, if, so if you see the slides up here, you're wondering what translation or what Bible version this is. This is the ESV, the English Standard Version. I'll be using several different versions along the way, uh, but majority of the slides are using the ESV. So Ephesians 1.10 says, it puts it this way, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment. This is the plan of God to bring unity, to bring togetherness, to bring oneness to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. So this is the central theme, the focus of the entire book. The huge plan of God to bring into oneness or togetherness everything in Christ. So God has a plan and it's already effective. And the first ones that he has brought into togetherness or oneness or unity under Christ and in Christ will be us, Christ followers. Those of us who have responded to the good news of Jesus Christ, we have received him and we are now entered into him and we are now in union, in oneness with him. So beginning with the Christians, beginning with the followers of Christ, God is slowly but definitely and surely rolling out the plan to bring all things in unity, all in heaven and on earth under Christ. So that's the central theme. Unity being togetherness as well as oneness. So we talked about this one simple way of understanding the entire letter or rather breaking down the entire letter or book of Ephesians will be this. The six chapters in total 
chapters 1 to 3 is where Paul lays down the doctrinal and the foundational. Everything that Christ has done, where, what are we now? We are saints. Where is our position? What has Christ done? And how have we gained from what Christ has done? All these things are doctrinal. All these things are for us to understand what has happened, what has occurred, and the consequences and the consequences and impact of what Christ has done. So one word that we can use to describe this doctrinal foundational portion of the letter of Ephesians is the word sit. So we find that in the in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, we are seated with Christ. Christ is seated at the right hand, and we are seated in him and with him. So that's oneness there, but it's also about how we are accomplished, we are full, and we are, in a sense, complete in Christ. Chapters 4 to 6, uh, just a recap, it's all about the practical living out of the doctrinal and the foundational that Paul covers in chapters 1 to 3. Because so what if I have all these theory and concepts and truths, but I don't live it out? Then it's totally useless. It's just information. It's just knowledge. But knowledge and information that isn't put to good use at all. And so Paul also spends some time in his letter, or the second portion, laying out practical aspects of what it means to be united together and one in Christ. And we did mention also last Thursday that he does it this way, doctrinal, foundational first, before the practical, because if we do not have the, if we don't have the uh, a correct understanding of where we are in Christ and what we have in Christ and who we are in Christ, then the practical aspects would simply be useless. The practical aspects would be, well, in a sense, similar to any other religion's teachings. You've got to be nice to each other, or then be karma. You've got to do this, you've got to do that. Because if not for the doctrinal bit on the central person of Christ, then the practical aspects would just seem like all religions teach us to do good, but there's no difference. No, the huge difference is found in chapters 1 to 3, Christ. By the practical side of things, chapters 4 to 6, that's a further breaking down. One, and then one, you can use the word, and all this is from Watchman Nee's book. One is walk. How do we live out? So uh, we'll be going through some verses later. So in some Bible versions of translations, they use the word live out. But in others, uh, they'll use the word, like the ESV, they use the word walk. Or NKJV, New King James Version, or the English Standard Version, they use walk. Some others, like um, NIV um, or the Christian Standard Bible, they use live out. So how do, what does it mean to live out this union that we hear about in chapters 1 to 3? And then, towards the end of the letter, we see this word there, standing. How do we stand victorious? How do we stay victorious in our unity, in our union with Christ? How do we, um, in a sense, how do we hold off and not just hold off, not just coping, but how do we also triumph over the things that the evil one will throw at us? So these are things, in a sense, how we can uh, understand the breakdown of efficiency. So this is what we talked about last week, one, two, three, all based on sit. And then this is what we'll be covering today, at least chapters four to somewhere in six. We'll be covering the aspect of walk today, living out that. But before that, and this is a recap um, we talked about last week, and this is essential, this is critical. Especially if you missed last Thursday's session, if you don't know about this bit, then it's going to be lost. Uh, we, won't, we won't really fully understand what Paul is trying to tell us in chapters 4 to 6. So Ephesians 1.20, this is about the sitting God put his power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And you need to understand this. You know, the reason why we do baptism sometimes in a, we leave it to people to choose, but we always encourage baptism by immersion. And the reason for that is you really go down under the water and that's symbolizing dying. And then you come out of the water that symbolizes being raised from the dead. And the reason we do that is not because we're just saying, you're, I'm dying to my old life. I'm just, I'm, once I come out, I want to live a new life. No, that's not, that's not it. The, the symbolism there is because we are dying with Christ in and we are raising with Christ. We are being raised with Christ from the dead. It's not just about me making a decision to change my lifestyle or to make good and proper biblical Christian decisions. No, it's not that. 
when we go through baptism in and out, it's because Christ died and I in Christ have died with him. Christ has been raised and I in Christ am raised with him. I've died to my old life, not just a mental decision based on my self uh, will and strength and power and discipline. And I've been risen in Christ because of the grace of God. And the life I now live is found in Christ. So that's the reason why he says it this way also, when he raised him from the dead and seated Christ at his right hand in the heavenly places. This is God the Father. This implies and this means us as well. We see in verse 21, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. So Christ is above all things now. And we are with him. In 2.5 of Ephesians, even when we were dead through our trespasses, God the Father made us alive together with Christ. By grace, by grace we have been saved, verse 6, and raised us up with him and seated us with Christ in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So now let me ask you this question and, and remember this, we are one. So it's not a trick question here. So if someone asks you now, where are you right now? You're okay, yeah, sure, you're at home now, you're in the living room, in the dining room or in the bedroom. Of course, yes. But in reality, this is our present lives here on earth. But when God looks at us, where does he see us? He sees us in Christ. And he sees us seated with Christ at his right hand. That's how close we are to him. Because we are Christ's body. Christ is the head. And all things are under his feet. Which then means also that we are also seated above all things. We share the authority of Christ because we are in Christ. We are one with him. We are together with him. We are united with him. You know, you think about this in the in in creation story in Genesis. Um, and we talked about this briefly also last Thursday. God spent six days creating the world. And then God created humans, Adam and Eve, and they were the pinnacle of his creation. And after six days of work, God rested. But for Adam and Eve, their first day was that of rest. And their first day was this, when God created them, he told Adam and Eve, I've placed all these under your care. You are in full authority of everything on earth now. If you take that story that we know so well from Genesis and you bring it all the way to this new creation story that we come across in the New Testament, then we see the parallel there. What God has done in the past, at the beginning, at the dawn of time, he is now doing in Christ a new creation all over again uh, but, uh, in Christ. And this time, we who are in Christ, the moment we die and we are up and we are a new creation, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we are a new creation, we are considered to be in Christ and straight away we are seated with Christ. When he raised us up, he set us down with Christ. We are resting as Adam did rest on the very first day of his. And just as Adam was placed in authority over all things that God has created, now we who are in Christ are seated with him and we are also placed in authority over all things. Why? Because everything, every name that is named is under the feet of Christ. So God never does anything that is weird or random. What he did in the creation story in Genesis, we see it being played out now, not in a physical way, but in a spiritual way in Christ. So we move on now. Someone says this, to quote, the Christian life from start to finish is based upon this principle of utter dependence upon the Lord Jesus. Adam and Eve did nothing to be created. Nothing at all. But they simply were created. And when they were created, they simply rested. The first day for them was Sabbath. And when they rested, they were also told that all things are in your authority. Same thing for us. We did nothing to deserve or we had no right to be recreated into new creation. We simply received and responded to the grace of Jesus Christ by faith. And we were, we were created. We became new creation. And the moment we were created into the new creation or new creatures, we were resting. 
we enjoyed the Sabbath, the rest in Christ, seated with him. And we also had all authority over everything else because in Christ, we have authority over everything. So the Christian life from start to finish is based upon this principle of utter dependence upon the Lord Jesus. He is the Alpha and the Omega, which means he is the beginning and the end, and we depend on him throughout. It's not just we depend on him at the beginning, we receive Jesus Christ, and we hope that at the end, the, the Omega will ensure that we get into heaven, and in between we are left to struggle on ourselves by ourselves. That's not the way the Christian life is meant to be lived out. It's meant to be walked out. From beginning to the end, it's full and utter dependence on the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a reason why we are in Him. So Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9, uh, it say, Paul says it this way, For by grace you have been saved through faith. That's all we did. We just had faith and we just received the grace. And this is not our own doing. It was fully dependent on Christ. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. That word, that phrase there, not a result of works, that's critical. We could never do it. We, we didn't do anything and we cannot ever do anything sufficient enough to receive salvation. Ephesians 2.10, Paul goes on to say this, for we are his workmanship. There's, another, there's a translation, I believe it's the New Living Translation that uses this word and it's beautiful. We are his masterpiece. Just as Adam and Eve were the pinnacle of his physical creation, so now we, in the spiritual creation, in the spiritual sense in Christ, we are his masterpiece, his workmanship, his masterpiece as the New Living Translation uses. We are his workmanship, his masterpiece, created where? In Christ Jesus for good works. So you see how Paul plays around. Earlier he says this, we have been saved, by grace we've been saved, through faith. Nothing to do with us. There was no work involved. But in 10, verse 10, he says this, we are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for good works. So it doesn't mean that, okay, all we've got to do now is focus on chapters 1 to 3, have all these beautiful, wonderful things about Christ and who we are and what we have, and then just stop there. No. There's something else beyond that. And Paul writes, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And there's a wonderful introduction or an, a wonderful hint in the letter of Paul to those in Ephesus that it's not just about all these wonderful things, you saints of Christ who are in Christ and who have so much in Christ. Having all these things are good, but there is a reason for them. We, are, ought, we ought to walk in them as well. And so with that, then we move on to this, the practical, the walking bit. Chapters 4 to 6. Um, let me share a story that I came across. Um, there was a man in, just try to, Agnes, would you mind stopping the share? I can't find my, Okay, it's okay. Ah, okay, thank you. There was a man who was working overseas uh, in a foreign country. So, and so he left his home. Um, he had a wife, he had a child, and he had a best friend. And so he left his home and his best friend was supposed to take care of his wife and his child and just still stay in touch. But he entrusted his family to them. So he went overseas to work for about a couple of years. When he came back to his home, uh, he realized that his wife and his best friend had gotten together and they had left. They had made a life together and then they ran away. So he came back discovering that he has lost his best friend, he has lost his wife, and he has lost his child. And this man was, or this man is, uh, well, the kind of story, he definitely is a Christian, was a Christian, he's a believer. And so he knew that he had to forgive. He knew that he had to move on. He knew he had to live the Christian life, love, not hate, all these things. But he found it so difficult. He always found it frustrating. One day he was at a meeting, 
a church meeting and he comes to this, the preacher after the meeting and he tells the preacher, you know, I shared the story and of course there's lots of bitterness and, and anger and pain in him. And he tells the preacher the story and he says, no matter what, I know what I need to do. I know how I ought to live my life. I know how I ought to respond to this situation that has occurred in my life. But no matter how hard I try, I just can't seem to forget. And I just can't seem to forgive. And I can't seem to release or remove this bitterness or this sense of discomfort and anger and pain that I experience inside me whenever, the, the, whenever I recall my best friend or my wife or my child. What should I do? And the preacher responded, the preacher who knew Ephesians 1 to 3 really well, the foundational, the doctrinal thing that Paul was talking about. The preacher responded to him and he says, this, that's the problem. Then the man said, what, what problem is it? The problem is that you are trying. And the man said, what do you mean by that? Are you trying to tell me that I shouldn't try at all? And the man and the preacher told him, yes, you shouldn't try. You're, when you're trying, it means that you are trying to do something that seems to be outside of you. But what you should be doing is to realize that you are in Christ. And this feeling, these feelings of bitterness, frustration, anger, hatred, wanting to take revenge and, and all these things, these feelings that are in you, that you are experiencing right now, these things have been in Christ, died and dealt with. When you died in Christ, this old man with all these negative things and thoughts died with Christ. And when you came up, when you were raised in Christ, you were a totally new person with full ability to live out what God has called us to live. Love, patience, kindness, forgiveness, and all these things. Yeah, I know for us, when we hear this, it sounds strange also because Singaporeans, we are a bunch who really go at it. We will work at something. But when this preacher told this man this, and this man's an engineer and all, this man suddenly said, wow, I get it now. When I try, I'm depending on myself. And the Christian life should be lived from beginning to the end in utter dependence on the Lord Jesus Christ. So I shouldn't try. I should simply remind myself, remember, and walk in the truth that I am in Christ. And all those negative feelings that I feel and those things that I feel that I can't overcome, those things have actually, in reality, already been dealt with. They're dead. And I'm a new person. And I'm able to. And several meetings after that, he meets this preacher and he says, yes, I'm beginning to move on. Not because I've tried, but because my mind clicked, my heart understood the truth about what being in Christ means, died in Christ, risen in Christ. So that one, that thing is so critical. But I'm going to move on now. I'm going to ask you to uh, refer to your Bibles now. I'm talking about walk. There's a reason why we need to walk. Because we don't want to be people who know all these things about Christ, like so heavenly, so knowledgeable about the Bible, but really useless on earth in a sense that we don't represent Christ well. You see, we are in Christ and there's a responsibility to, re to represent and to express Christ for the world. Because so what if you tell your neighbor or your friend or someone that I know all these things, I'm in Christ, I'm such a wonderful, I'm a saint in Christ, but we live our lives in a different way that people wonder, if that's a saint in Christ, I'd rather be a sinner outside of Christ. And I think we're doing a huge disservice to the name of Christ. So turn your Bibles now and look at Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. And I'm going to be reading from uh, the, the version this big Bible is, uh, contains. And that's the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version. Oh, sorry, this is the, oh, this is the NIV. I'll be reading from the NIV. So if you're having the NIV, you hear the same words. If not, don't worry. Um, all the Bibles are, are same, just certain words difference. And as I mentioned earlier, when you hear the word live, it actually means walk. It's the same word as walk in the ESV as well as in the New King James Version. So several versions use walk, some others, because walk might seem like, what do you, what do you mean by walking, walking in the life of Christ? It's, it used the word live out. So it's better understood. 
But turn to your Bibles now. I'm going to be looking at our Bibles from here on quite a fair bit, from chapters 4 to 6. And verse 1 to 3. As a prisoner for the Lord then, and this is one again, a reminder that this is considered to be one of the prison epistles. Paul writes this while he's in prison, uh, while, while he's in prison, because of his work and his life for Christ. As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. So in other translations, I urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received. What's this calling? You're called to be in Christ. Called to be in Christ, holy and all those things that we read about in chapter one. As a calling of that, Walk worthy of this. Verse 2, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Why is this important now? Uh, remember this verse in John love one another as I have loved you by this shall all men know that you are mine disciples if you have love for one another and that's why it's important you see when Christ came not only did God through him make us one with Christ but even on this Zoom thing here now, there are quite a few of us here. All of us are one in Christ, which means all of us are also one with each other. We are one family. We are all united and together in Christ. And therefore, you see those words there in verse 3, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And the verse before that, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Why? Because if we proclaim that we are one in Christ, that we are saints in Christ, that in Christ our old person has died and we are new in creation now and all these things, but yet we can't stand each other. We treat each other badly. We are arrogant and proud and conceited in the way we engage one another as Christ believers. We are anything but gentle. We are rough. Maybe not in the way we use uh, hands or actions, but maybe in the way we talk. We are cutting. We're not gentle. We are hurting. We're anything but patient. We're always impatient with people. And we don't bear with one another in love, obviously. Because if we're not humble, gentle, or patient, we can't say we love each other. And... By this, by love, shall all men know that you are my disciples. So again, we see this. Please walk and live a life worthy of the calling as a saint in Christ. We have all these wonderful things in Christ. Now we are a new person. Walk it out. Live it out. Why? Because just as we are one in Christ, we are one with each other. I don't know if you recall this. You know, Holy Communion Services... It's been a while since some of you have come back to the physical services, but um, we've had Holy Communion online at least also for the past few months, two or three months. One of the things that we always say in the Holy Communion rituals is by your spirit, make us one with Christ. God has done that. And one with each other. It's equally important. It's not just about like that. It's not just about seated in Christ but it's also about walking it out. Walking it out, horizontal plane, walking with the people that also are seated with Christ. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Now drop down to verse 17. In verse 17 of chapter 4, Paul writes this again, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. When he uses the word Gentiles, it's not because he, he doesn't look at them as equals. 
for him, Gentiles before they know Christ, they are also like uh, the other part. I mean, they are they are they are different. They are immoral. They are not yet saints. So do not live uh, live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. So you look at verse 17, you see this word there. Um, you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. If you're using an ESV version, if you're using uh, NKJV, New King James Version, you'll see the words there, no longer walk as the Gentiles do. So just these two verses here in John uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, as well as verse 17, we're told this, Paul says, walk worthy of the calling that you have in Christ and do not walk in the manner of the Gentiles, not a race thing, not a race issue, but the Gentiles being those outside of Christ who have not yet been renewed, who are not yet in Christ. Do not walk or live your lives like them. Now go down to Ephesians chapter 5. You there, Ephesians chapter 5, and then we look at verse 1 and 2. Ephesians chapter 5, verse, verses 1 and 2. Before we before I read that, I just I just hope this these two Thursdays haven't been the, the two times in this entire year that you open up your Bibles to read. Uh, you know, if you, if you use the digital, someone was saying this last week. Someone told me, like, wow, um, the person had forgotten what a joy it is to be able to flip open the hard copy Bible and just to look at all the words, the words of truth, the words of life. Uh, there's something different when you read off the screen and when you just open the word and, and just read it. Uh, even, in the, even in the natural, uh, many studies have been done and they say that when you read something in, in, on copy, on paper, you actually comprehend it or remember it better than when it's off the screen. But look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2 now. It says this, Be imitators of God. Therefore, as dearly loved children, we are in Christ, there's a calling on us, we are saints, and we are dearly loved children. And live a life of love. So you see the word live again down there? It's walk in love. So again, the word walk comes out. So in a sense, be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love. Walk in love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering. So to walk in a manner that is worthy of our calling as saints and children of God means to walk in love. It means to live out that love that Christ has given us. And then now, drop down a few verses again to verse 8. And you see this. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. In some other translations, live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And verse 10, and discern or find out what is pleasing or pleases the Lord. Do you catch this? Just, just in these two chapters itself, chapters 4 and 5, Paul has spoken about the need to walk in a certain way, the need to live our lives in a certain way. Why? Again, once again, it's because of Ephesians 2.10. As I read earlier, it says there, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So Paul, again, it's just a few verses for you to see for yourself in the Bible, in Ephesians, just in chapter 4 and 5, chapters 4 and 5, you see four occasions where Paul uses the word walk or live. And you see it down here. And the need for us to see it is because this is an important component of our Christian lives. As critical and essential 
as the doctrinal and foundational bit of who we are in Christ. And we and that one is so critical because without that, this whole portion of walking is not possible, it's impossible. But as essential as that is, from that essential doctrinal foundational position and place, we need to also move to a place where that for that dive we have in Christ is lift out for the world to see. And we could summarize it in one simple sentence or phrase, what that means to live out that life, it means this, to walk in love. As Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2 says, walk in love or live a life of love. That sums up everything in chapters 4 all the way down to 6 before the armor of God. Walk in love. That's all there is to it. And you know, if you are in Topayo, you've been in Topayo for a while, uh, this word love and this reminder and this challenge and this encouragement to live out love, it can't be new to us here. Our vision statement is encounter God to love. To love what? To love God, obviously. Every encounter needs to bring a radical transformation in our lives for us to grow closer in intimacy and fellowship with God. To love God, that's all No, To love one another, that's important here. Love one another. By this shall all men know that we are his disciples. And to love the world. Why? Because for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And if God still loves the world today, surely we must also love the world. So we love God. We encounter God to love God, love one another, and to love the world. And you think about it. Isn't that what that holy communion ritual that I talked about earlier uh, reminds us? By your spirit, make us one with Christ up there, one with each other, love God, love people. And then what? In ministry to all the world. Why? Because we love God. We love the world until Christ comes and we feast at his heavenly table, banquet together. Love God, love one another, and love the world. And this is what Paul is centering on. This unity that we have in Christ must come out in a unity among Christians, fellow believers. And as we love the world, it will, we are playing out and we are active participants in God's plan to unite everything under Christ or in Christ. The plan that we, look, we saw in chapter 1 earlier. So we are active participants. We love God. In Christ, we love God. We love one another. Because by, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. And by doing these things, we are also loving the world. That God's plan of unity and togetherness and oneness will be fulfilled in this time. So let's look at several things now. You're going to look at, um, in chapters 4 to, well, the first portion of 6 at least, you see that Paul talks about the private lives, the private aspects of life, of our lives, as well as the public aspect of our lives. So for example, um, look at 5.22. Uh, it's wives and husbands. And sometimes this is preached in uh, wedding services. I think, you know, when I do weddings, I usually ask the couple, um, is there a verse that you want to be your theme verse at your wedding service? I mean, you get married once in your lifetime, right? So if you want me to preach uh, or share a short message at your wedding, I don't, I don't preach long messages at the weddings. I say, just tell me, is there a verse that you feel led to, that you feel you want to be the focal point in your, in your lives as a couple? Um, is there something or it's a reminder about something that you want to hold on to in your lives as a couple, as a married couple? Um, and I tell them also, and if you do not have a verse, now that I'm asking you and you do not have a verse, please do not Google and say wonderful marriage verses and then you give me one. I mean, that's not going to cut it. It's not something relevant to you. It's not something meaningful to you. And most of the time, they give me a verse. And I think up to now, no couple has ever given me these few verses uh, to be their wedding text. And I think maybe if they... If I insist on this, there might not be a wedding after that. You see, this few verses here is uh, sometimes people get all riled up and they, they, they wonder and they debate about what this actually means. And is there who's in the right? Let me read this now in 522 onwards. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And straight away, it's like it's such a sexist thing, right? Why must the female submit? 
and well, the husband is the head and of the uh, is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. And people say, "Wow, what kind of thing is this? This is very archaic. This is a very old thing." Because now oh, some women are the head of the households. So why should the women uh, be subject or submit submit to the husbands? Of which he is the savior. Christ is the head of the church, which is the savior. Twenty four. So as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. And then he says this: Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church, and gave himself up for her. So what? Women submit to the uh, wives submit to the husbands, but no need to love them. And husbands love the wives, but no need to submit to them. I mean, what's this? Is this, is this should be like mutual love and mutual submission? And these things sound a bit off. Um, gave himself, made her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water, etc., etc., et cetera, et cetera. Verse 28, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of the church, and so on. And so on. So let me just explain this bit here. Remember, Paul is addressing about walking out the calling, living out that life worthy of our calling in Christ. The practical aspect of all the things that he has talked about. So private as well as public. But here he talks about the private aspect. But even here, he's not just giving out um, good marriage advice or giving out what he feels are rules uh, for happy life together as a couple. He's not doing so. You realize the language he uses. He's using the language of unity and union. Even on this rules or this suggestions or not as advice on what we should do, how we should live our lives, our husbands and wives, he's basing it on what he has talked about in chapters one to three. We are one with Christ. The church and Christ, we are one. In the eyes of God, when someone gets married, two becomes one. And so here, the church is the bride or the wife, and the husband is Christ, the picture. The picture of union and unity, togetherness and oneness is once again used to, to tell us and to encourage us that this is the way to live. And when we look at this, we'll say, ah, oh, there's this thing I don't agree with, there's this thing I don't agree with. Do I submit when he's not right? Do I love when they are not? You know, all these other questions that comes out. Before we explain all that, let's move on down now to chapter 6. And here again, uh, this sometimes we use these verses for uh, maybe like Children's Day or something, Father's Day, Mother's Day and all. And it says, As children obey your parents in the Lord. This is verse 1 of chapter 6. You can refer to your Bibles as well. Once again, I'm reading from the NIV, New International Version. Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may go well with you and you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, so there's two sides. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Of course, when he talks about fathers, he's just referring to it because the males are meant to be the head of the households. But of course, the mothers have a part to play too. Let's move on down now from the private aspects of our lives to the public, the economic or the marketplace almost. Slaves, obey your earthly masters. This is verse 5. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Verse 6. Obey them not only to win their favor. The other hands, don't, don't suck up to them. Don't just do things because you want them to like you. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eyes on you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Verse 7, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men. Because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he is slave or free. In verse 9, in this marketplace, economic, economic aspect, of, public aspect of our lives, masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no favoritism with God. Now, in this two portions of scriptures that we just read, from verse 22 of chapter 5 all the way down to verse 9, oh, sorry, verse, that's right, verse 9 of 
chapter 6, the private and the public aspects of our lives. We can just call it that. Uh, these are just examples. Of course, there are many other arenas and many other facets of our lives. But these are just some portions that he brings out. So once again, wives and husbands, the picture of unity in God's eyes, two are one. And the idea here, illustration here is the church is the bride and the wife and Christ is the bridegroom and the husband. And together, they are one. And therefore, based on that oneness, we too, as husbands and wives in our private settings, should also treat each other as one, in love, walking in love. Remember, Ephesians 5, 2 is the key phrase here in the second portion, walking in love. And then children, same thing. They're all in Christ. So now children, we talk about children and slaves and earthly masters. It's whether you are father and son, mother and daughter, in Christ we are what? One. There is a oneness together here. Same for slaves and masters, whether it's private or public, slaves and masters, bosses and em employers and employees, whatever it is, whatever names you call it, even today, doesn't matter. As long as you are a Christ follower, you are one. In Christ, we are all one. There's a unity, there is a togetherness, and there is a oneness. And therefore, walk in love in all these situations. In situations that are even not listed here by Paul. Whether it's private or public, walk in love. The difficulty that we would experience is this. Who's in the right? Who's in the right? I'm a wife. I ought to submit to my husband. But when he's not doing something that I like, or he's not, he's not lived his life or said something that I agree with, must I still submit? I mean, we're not talking about the husband doing something wrong or bad. It's just a disagreement. Must I still submit to him? Because that's not the wisest thing, isn't it? And that's not the nicest thing to do or the, the, the best thing to do. Should I submit to him? I'm in the right. He's in the wrong. Slaves and masters, same thing. Should I, why should I pour in so much of my effort as an employee or even as a, well, a servant, in a sense here, slaves and master? Why must I do that? Even though it's a Christian, so what? Shouldn't I rest and slack off when I can? I mean, my whole life is his, really. He owns me. So why should I do this? Or as an employee today, let's say in today's terms, I'm just getting a salary. It's not my business. I'm working to get a paycheck. It's his business. At the end of it, he earns so much. So why should I work so hard? It's my right to do only this much. Flip side, for the bosses, why should I treat them nicely? Why should I not threaten them, the, slave, the, the masters or the bosses? Why should I not do things to, to milk them and to get them to do more, even though they are, they, are believe, they, are, they, are, they are Christians or they are one in Christ with me? It's my right. It's not their right. Family relationships also. How many times have family relationships broken off or broken down or gotten strained at the very least? Because... It's my right to say this, to do this, to use this. It's not your right. And who's in the right? You know this word, who's in the right? Which means, if you can further elaborate or translate down, to whether are you deserving of my love? Because submission here and loving the wives as, as like Christ loved the church, all these things, obeying your earthly masters with respect and fear, with sincerity, honoring your parents, do not exasperate your children, and all these things, treat your slaves in the same way, do not threaten, all these things come under that phrase we see in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2, walk in love. And if we could say that Paul's, the way we summarize Paul's teachings in chapters 4, 5, 6, is that three words, walk, those three words, walk in love, then I suppose we could also say this, that the four words that stop us from walking in love will be those four words. Whose right is it? Or who's in the right? Is it right or wrong? I'm deserving of this, he's not, or he's not deserving of this, I am. All these questions. And for that, once again, we throw back or we go back to creation at the beginning, at the dawn of time. 
because we are new creation, right? At the dawn of time, when God created the heavens and the earth and human beings, Adam and Eve and all that, God told them to just live their lives and they could just do whatever they wanted. There was one tree, the, uh, the, uh, there was a tree of life that they could eat from, isn't it? You, I mean, you all know the story. Eat from any tree that you want to, including the tree of life that was right in the middle of the, of the entire garden, of the entire garden. Eat from any tree, even the tree of life. But one tree do not touch. The fruit, don't, don't touch it. The tree of the knowledge of, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Yeah. So what's good and evil? Knowledge of good and evil, we could put it in simpler words. What's right and what's wrong? So Adam and Eve were told to eat of any fruit, including from the one of the tree of life. If you eat that, you have the life. You have life, just life. But one tree you don't take, don't touch. I mean, don't, don't eat the fruit from. Uh, and that's the knowledge of good and evil, what's right and what's wrong. So from the beginning, right at the beginning, God's plan for his creation, for the humans, was this, that it is not for us to decide what's right and wrong and to decide whether it's deserving or undeserving. But we were simply to live from the life that God has given us. From the tree of life, from the fruit of the tree of life, we're simply to live from whatever the life that God has given us, to be sustained by it, to live by it, to walk in that life, and not walk by our knowledge of good and evil, and not walk by our perception of what's right and what's wrong. And today, as new creation, seated in Christ, no less, the pinnacle, the workmanship, the masterpiece of God. Um, God never used the word, I mean, in the sense, he never used the word masterpiece when he created in Genesis. He said it's very good. But here in Ephesians, we are told that we are God's masterpiece. As his masterpiece, as his workmanship, we are told to live by what? By the life of Christ. And told to live out whatever we are led to do and whatever God commands us to do. And not to live by, look, that's right, that's wrong. He's undeserving. She's undeserving. She does not deserve my love. He does not deserve my forgiveness. Why should I treat them with respect? And He doesn't deserve it. Just position in life or status. And it's nothing to do with those things. We're not called to live by that. Whose right is it? We're called to live by this life in us. How do we do that? Another story. There was this person who... Um, uh, encountered a, a person in, in, in church and this other person said and did certain things to hurt him just two males he was very hurt uh, not angry but just hurt and so every time uh, he sees the person in church you know here mentally he knows that he needs to love the person I mean walk in love right Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2 forgive as Christ has forgiven us. Uh, just in case you're wondering, turn to your Bibles now, please. Look at chapter 4, um, 29 onwards. Uh, just look at your Bibles as I read this. 29 onwards. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Verse 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Then he goes on, be imitators of God, therefore I dearly love children and walk in love, live a life of love. So this person obviously found it difficult because he had been hurt. And maybe there wasn't any rage, but there was obviously for some form of bitterness. It remained inside there. It was painful. It was hurt. And so he, he tried. Again, this word try. He tried to forgive the person. And so when he sees the person in church, 
in his mind because he wants to do what's right, to walk in love. He, he tells himself he needs to go up there and smile and strike up a conversation. But when he goes close to the person, all these feelings of, and remembrance or memory of the hurt rises up. And all he can do is just give a smile. And obviously, the smile is not a very uh, nice, genuine, warm one, just, just like a forced smile. But at least he smiled. And he couldn't bring himself to converse. And then he walks off and he knows, ah, oh, that again. And one day he meets this pastor, a preacher, and he tells him, he shares this bit with him, and he says, You know what? I, I pray. And I pray and I say, God, please give me the love for this person. Please give me the ability or the love that I need to love this man, this brother in church. And this pastor tells him, that's where you went wrong. Because every time when you talk about wanting and trying to love someone and asking God to give you that, you're looking at love as it, it's almost like a commodity. It's almost like a, a device or an instrument, something for you to use in order to obey. And so God give me the love that I need to love this brother. And you're asking for something outside of yourself, but internally, your mind and your heart is wrestling with this idea that, but this person doesn't deserve it. Whose right is it? And what we should be doing, what you should be doing, the pastor tells him, is this. To realize that everything that you need to love this brother is already in you. I, I know you guys can't answer me because otherwise we have a, many, many voices coming up and echoes and all that in the Zoom. But, but just, just think about it this way. Do you think God has kept anything good from us. Do you think that we are in Christ now and Christ is in us? And in, turn to your Bibles now, Ephesians chapter 1. Look at 1 verse 3, chapters 1 verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with what? all or every spiritual blessing in Christ. Now, let me ask you now, not a trick question, based on this one verse here, verse 3 of chapter 1, do you think there is anything that we are lacking of in Christ? No, not a trick question. There is nothing that we lack in Christ because in Christ we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. So for us to come to God, and I, I do that sometimes. I mean, I, I know that, oh Lord, I need this love. I, I, I need love for this brother. I need love for this person. I need, I need the ability to forgive and all that. And, and that means I have forgotten this doctrinal and foundational truth that Paul took three chapters to tell us that in Christ you have everything. You want to forgive, it's in you. You want to love, it's in you. All we have to do now is pull that thought out about whether is he deserving or not. And how do, we, how, do we, how do we deal with that thought? Is he deserving or not? Whose right is it? How do we deal with that? When we remember how we got to our place in Christ. By grace, through faith, were you saved. Not by any works that no man can boast. If you have received this grace through faith, not by anything you have done, where, who, Whose right is it that you got saved? Am I deserving of this grace? Of course not. Now, if I can hold on to how I, how I got myself, not, not how I got myself, but how I became to be in Christ, if I can remember that, hold on to that, then it will be, be this. I am simply eating from the tree of life. I'm simply consuming or eating the fruit of the tree of life, because I'm going back to this life I have in Christ. I'm undeserving. There was no right. I had no right to be here, but yet I am. And I'm moving away from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What's right and what's wrong? Is he deserving? Is that deserving? And we're not called to live by that. We're called to live by in Christ. I have everything possible. In Christ, I'm taking in me undeserving, 
of forgiveness, of grace, of salvation, of the Holy Spirit sealing me, undeserving of all spiritual blessings in Christ, but yet God has done this to me. So that's the life I'm, I'm going to live out now. The life in Christ. Who am I to say someone else is undeserving of that forgiveness and that love that God has placed in me to offer and to show and to express? And that's how we move away from that stumbling block of being unable to obey and therefore trying to do things. So this pastor told this man, the love you have for this brother that hurt you is in you. It's just there. If you only just know and go out there and let it naturally come forth, you'll be fine. How does that work? You know, it's like, how does this tie in? An example is given. Um, if you are in a race, you know, because sitting in a walking thing, remember the first two portions, sit, walk and stand. So sitting, first three chapters, walk now, first five, uh, chapters five to six. How do we, if it's a race, and you are in a, let's say a F1, I mean, there's no F1 this year, I know it's all cancelled and all, but let's say F1, a car race or whatever it is. You are seated, but yet you are moving. You see the picture there? You are walking, you are living out, but yet you are seated. And that's what we are called to do. There's a picture of, um, you know, it's an old picture. Uh, you see on bookmarks and all that, but you always see Jesus carrying a little lamb. Have you all seen those pictures? Uh, Jesus, like a shepherd, and then there's a lamb on his shoulder, a baby lamb on his shoulder. But obviously, all, Jesus is always like a, I mean, on a Caucasian and all, but it's an old picture, but he holds the lamb. Now, the lamb is moving. The lamb is walking. The sheep, the lamb, is moving along in the journey. But the lamb or the sheep is not doing thing, anything by its own strength and will. The lamb or sheep is simply seated, resting on all that Christ has done. The lamb doesn't need to say, is this right or is this wrong? Is it deserving or undeserving? The lamb simply rests and whatever the lamb has in this, on his shoulders and has from the shepherd, the lamb simply lives it out in his or her life. And that's what we're called to do. To walk in love means to do just that. To sit there, draw from him, and then live out and walk in love. You know, you see things like, look at um, chapter 4 now, verse 25. Each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of the body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. Those who have been stealing, stop stealing. Work. Do something useful. And all these things, they're all very practical things. And it means this, therefore, that the private and, private and um, the, the public aspect of our lives, this whole few chapters here are all about living out and walking out the life that Christ has given you and that you have in Christ. I'm going to pause here for a while. Um, I'm going to ask, us, you know, this is not just about teaching and and everything, but um, and uh, occasionally we talk about things like that as well. Um, walking in love. The reality is saying it, walking in love is way easier than living it out. But if we understand what who we who we have and who we are and what we have in Christ, it makes it so much easier. And I thought amidst 835 now, and I thought we'll spend some time allowing God to speak to us based on these few verses, these two chapters here, and walking in love. Um, there is only so much we can say about walking in love. But Paul has given us what it means to walk in love. Let me just end with this one verse before we just spend some time in prayer. How do we do that? And talked about all that's in us. Look at Ephesians chapter 3, 
And look at verse 20, which is one of our verses for our anniversary this year. And this is at the end, towards the end of his three chapters on doctrinal and the foundational bit of being in Christ. He says this, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work. Where? Where's the power at work? Within us. That's right. It's within us. It's not something outside of us because in Christ we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. So whatever God calls us to do, whatever we read down here in the chapters 4 to 6, it's to always go back to that, the power that works within us. That is what will sustain us. That is what will allow us to live out, live out, not trying to live, to do something, but live out the life that God has called us to live. Amen. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Come, let's spend some time in prayer now, shall we? And, um, you know, as human beings, we have this unfortunate tendency to sometimes um, not walk enough. Uh, Sometimes we lose things, we lose it. And we either need to seek forgiveness or we need to forgive. We need to express love in whatever forms or situations that may require it. Is it right? Is it wrong? That's not the question to ask. Is he or she deserving or undeserving? That's not the question to ask. The call for us is to walk in a manner that's worthy, to live our lives worthy of this life that Christ has placed in us. And that means, whether it's right or wrong, doesn't matter. For us, it's just to let the life flow through us. Come, let's pray um, and allow God to just minister for a bit. Father, we thank you for this evening that we can come and look at the practical aspects of your word and of Ephesians and be reminded of the call to walk in love and how really that is walking out that oneness that we have in Christ. Lord, we know that sometimes as we read these things, uh, they seem almost impossible. And Lord, we thank you that Paul was led by you to say that it's only by the power that works within us, not external to us, but within us. So Lord, open the eyes of our hearts. Help us to once again comprehend your love, the amazing depths of your love. Help us to come to the fullness uh, in terms of knowledge and understanding and comprehension of who we are and what we have in your son, Jesus Christ. Help us to continuously depend on our tree of life, Christ, and help us to live out that life. Father, as we spend some time in prayer right now, as brothers and sisters, Lord, we ask you to remind us, Lord, bring into our memories now people that we ought to forgive or people whom we need to make right with in our, term, in our relationships. Forgive us if we have been the cause of, un, uh, of disunity when your word calls us to Make every effort to preserve the unity. Forgive us when we have been the cause of this unity. And Lord, teach us with your Holy Spirit, lead and guide us on allowing that power that works within us to flow out of us. To love, to forgive, to be patient, to be gentle, to put others before us, to consider others before us. And through that, allow us to walk in a manner that's worthy of our calling as saints in Christ. Father, for those of us who have been hurt, we thank you that your grace is there to heal us and to make us whole. We thank you that in you, the memory of that hurt will not hold us back. But in you, the power that works within us will also allow us to overcome hurt 
and return the hurt with love and blessing. So Father, we thank you. We commit our lives into your very faithful, gentle, loving hands. And we commit ourselves to walking in this life that God, that you have called us to. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.